Well, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back. Joining me tonight is the one, the only, the famous. Uh, Y'all know him by the, by now, Mr. Zach Davis. Zach, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, Travis. Glad we're doing it. Good to be here. Yeah, me too. My me and my five year old, my two year old, we've had the flu or something for two or three days. So if I look and sound and behave like I've got a foot in the grave, it's because I've been asleep for like two days. So I'm uh I'm glad we're good enough to do this too. So. Zach and I have been talking, and uh, one of our favorite <laughs> kind of topics, I guess, um, put some stuff out, and we decided we'd talk about it. So, that being said, this video is called Post Millennialism, Moscow, and Thoughts from the Bunker. And, Zach, what's that bunker about? What's that mean? Uh, somebody up north in a famous potato state, I guess they, they took indecisive shots at us, uh, but we'll run with it. So, we'll take the bunker. I will take that opportunity to say, though, that the bunker is growing, evidently, because we're on pace to sell out the Arkansas Eschatology Conference. So if anybody is interested in uh, coming and being a part of that, that would be time to go and buy uh, the tickets. And we'll put the link to that down below. Yeah, absolutely mind blowing. Um, going to be a good time, though. So. All right. So where, where we're going with this, a CREC pastor named Jeremy Sexton recently released a critique of postmillennialism. And you can see um, the title page for his article below. But in this article, this guy came out, I mean, guns blazing. It was a really well written article, um, really well researched. So I'll give him that. But he dropped names, including that of Doug Wilson, Douglas Wilson, pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. And I think Probably everybody watching this is familiar with Doug. He's a very big name guy. Uh, but Pastor Wilson, who is not exactly known for backing down from a fight, unless that fight includes guys named Mike Sullivan or Don Preston, <clears throat> he fired back with his own piece. And you can see that below, too. This is Snip uh, straight from the blog and May blog page. And he titled it A Sevenfold Rejoinder to Jeremy Sexton. So, after reading both these articles, and I'll admit Jeremy's article took a long time because it was a really long article, but what became clear to me is that Pastor Sexton, he, he put a lot of time and effort and exegesis into his, whereas just being honest, the vibe that I got from Doug's is that he more or less just responded for the sake of responding. Um, after all, it was what he called just a rejoinder, which by definition is simply a reply, especially a quick, witty, or critical one, to a question or remark. Um, that's not really relevant, regardless of who did more work. What we're here to discuss tonight, that's why me and Zach are doing this, is who was right. And by right, we mean who was biblical. Um, because there were some good things said, I felt like, on both sides. But, um, Zach, I think both guys kind of whiffed it in some major areas, too. And so we're not going to go in-depth and talk about every single possible thing that we could have, but we are going to look at a couple. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not our aim, just so everybody knows. We know we're not doing a comprehensive deal here. So right. just just a couple main issues. We'll we'll hit the enemies, we'll hit some great commission stuff and run some run some trails on that. Yeah. So we're gonna look at some, not all of the things these guys said. And like Zach said, we're gonna start with the Great Commission. So uh, Jeremy said this and, and Doug quoted this in his article. So and you can just assume if I'm saying Jeremy, I'm talking about his article, if it says Doug. That's his article. But Jeremy says, fourth, the apostolic era saw the success <clears throat> of the Great Commission. And then Doug responds with this really long paragraph. Bear with me. Uh, but he says, now I happen to agree that what Christ was talking about in Matthew 24, 14 did happen back in the first century. And so the way was cleared for the end of Jerusalem to come. That chapter is all about the destruction of 70 AD and the gospel being declared throughout the entire Roman Empire. Oikumene was all part of the run-up to that. It was not as though the minds had to hear the gospel preached before the days of vengeance could descend upon Judea. But when Christ gave his great commission to the disciples, the Mayans and the Japanese and the Eskimos and the Zulu and whatever other tribe his missionaries might ever encounter were very much in view. The great commission is not fulfilled until all the nations are baptized and discipled and they stay baptized and discipled. In the Gospel of Mark, we are told to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. If it is moving, preach the gospel. As far as that is concerned, we are nowhere close to being done with that assigned task. Zach, I, seen you, I saw you grinning through the entire thing, and I know what you're thinking. 
And I think if we hit the next slide, that'll probably shed some clarity on that. Uh, well, let me back up because he said something here that I thought was funny, I, I, and I'm sure you caught it too. But he said back in the first century, the way was cleared for the end of Jerusalem to come. So he qualified the end there. Did you catch that? Not not just the end, as the disciples put it, but the end of Jerusalem. Well, that end is going to come up a little bit later, and I think that's why you're mentioning that right now. That he's notice and remember this for later when we get to some anonymous chapter called First Corinthians 15 about an end that Doug has already qualified. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, uh, Zach, are we still waiting on the Great Commission to be fulfilled? Uh, no, we're not. Um, I don't think that we are. And the reason that we say that is because the scripture tells us plainly that it has been. And what the main thing we're fixing to trace out is all the wording that's here. And I've done this before and took a little bit of heat over saying this, but it, it still can't be refuted biblically. Um, I don't know if Doug knows it or not. I mean, surely somebody's shown him a chart like this. I mean, we're not the first ones to come up with this. So if they can see the consistency here, the main thrust of what you and I are going to talk about is that you can't separate the, the comings of 2414 and Matthew 28, the Great Commission text. That's exactly right. And so looking at this chart, what, what we just wanted to show y'all is that in, in your New Testament, there are five Greek words that somehow or another are all interrelated to this, this Great Commission, the gospel going forth. Um, you know, the nations being discipled and so forth before the end. Um, and we've laid them out here in a pretty easy way to see. You can see the prediction as well as the corresponding fulfillment. And so the first one is the word oikimene, which is the one Doug just mentioned in that article. But the prediction is, is Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world, the oikimene, as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And then you see the fulfillment, the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 18. Uh, what, Zach, some 20 or so years later saying, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So Jesus is saying the gospel is going to go to the whole world. And, and Paul is saying that it had done that. Christ's words will fulfill. Uh, Zach, you want to take ethnos? Yeah, ethnos, the predictions in Mark 13, 10. And the gospel must first... Uh, be proclaimed to all nations, ethnos. And you see the fulfillment in Romans chapter 16, 26, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, ethnos, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. One thing that's interesting about ethnos and the understanding of it is that Number one, you see the consistency right here in Romans chapter 16, verse 26, that it's already happened. Mm -hmm. And Mark stated it would happen. Doug has this understanding in mind. So this, I mean, this lays the foundation for setting himself up, I think, for failure when we get to Matthew chapter 28. Because you're right in the paradigm of 80, 70 and Matthew 24, 14 in this Mark 13 text, which is the equivalent of Matthew 24, 14 that Doug would take and put this in the first century. But where he's going to run into problems is when we see ethnos a little bit later in the slideshow. So remember ethnos, and we'll trace it for you in just a little bit to show you how Doug runs into some inconsistencies by separating these two things. Yeah, that's right. And so the other three, you can see their cosmos going to the world, proclaiming the gospel. And then Paul again is saying that it, the gospel, is bearing fruit, growing all over the world. You've got the catesis. Uh, Doug said if it moves, it preaches the gospel to it. Uh, I don't think he literally meant preach the gospel to your dog. I don't know. Hey, anyway, let me ask a question. On Catesis there, I know Doug's a big proponent of Romans 8. Is uh, When we see a creation creature in Romans 8, is it Catesis? It is. Yes, it is. So the whole creation, the, the whole creature, right, is groaning. Right. So we so Doug has an understanding in the Great Commission passage then that when he says preach to every uh, to the whole creation, and it's catesis. That catesis can be used something other than a physical planet. So note that connection to Romans 8, if you're listening. That's right. And the, I don't know how much you want to labor that out, but Romans 8, simply put, is is about the bondage that the people are under, under the old covenant. It has nothing to do with rocks and leaves and things like that. But Well, it has every, Romans 8 has everything to do with this commission stuff, too, because yes, when, you're, when you're talking about 
the gospel being preached to uh, the creation. Well, that creation, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The creation is groaning in bondage and birth pangs, that second Exodus imagery. And that's connected to the old covenant system, by the way. But that language is connected to the same idea as the commission because Deuteronomy 32 predicted and Romans already had, well, Romans after Romans 8 and chapters 10 and 11, it'll talk about how that judgment on Israel as the gospel went out to the nations and they uh, repented and believed. So Catesis tracing the wording to Romans 8 and here, uh, there's a direct parallel. Yeah, that's good. And then the last word is the gee, the gay. Um, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, the gay. Uh, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has, has gone out to all the earth. And there it is again, the gee and their words to the ends of the world. So we just wanted to show you this to show you that uh, the inspired Bible writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit made this as clear as they possibly could have, right? You've got the prediction, and then within two or so decades, you see crystal clear um, as far as their concept of the world, the land, the oikumene, whatever, as far as that goes, it was fulfilled. And so what we what we need to, I guess it's something me and Zach talk about all the time, is you have to think like a first century Jew to understand this book. And so when me and you read that, we automatically assume that, yeah, it's talking about the Zulu and the Mayans and all. Doug said that's who Jesus had in view, right? Uh, well, not according to the Apostle Paul, because he's saying it's already a done deal. And for them to try to differentiate all these texts in Matthew 28 and put it on its own little shelf over here as the standalone, you know, ongoing thing, it just doesn't work. I can hear somebody clipping your comment right there and taking that video span and saying, see, these guys think the commission's filled. Therefore, there's nothing for us today. We're going to get well, there. Hold your We're going to get there. So hold your clips, guys. Hold your clips. All right. So Jeremy sees the Great Commission as being fulfilled in the first century. And in his article, he has about four bullet points as to why. But notice this one in particular. He says, quote, second, all the nations does not imply worldwide comprehensiveness. Postmillennialists recognize this intuitively in Matthew 24, 14, which uses the same phrase. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Notice this part. Postmillennialists rightly understand that this prophecy was fulfilled during the generation of the apostles. However, they do not imagine that the gospel literally went to every nation in the world, and they certainly do not suggest that it was proclaimed throughout the totality of every nation during the apostolic era. They ascribe neither worldwide nor nationwide comprehensiveness to the proclamation of the gospel to all the nations predicted in 2414. So he at least appears to agree here, Zach, that all the nations in the Olivet Discourse refers to the nations of the Roman Empire. Is that fair? I think that's what he's saying. He's saying, and again, I want to I want to highlight this. He agrees that postmillennialists post rightly understand that this prophecy was fulfilled during their generation. But watch what he does with these nations later on. And this just really stuck out to me. So toward the end of the article, and again, this thing's long. I think it took me like 20 minutes to read this thing. But he's hammering Doug for taking Revelation 19, 11 through 21 to be fulfilled in AD 70. And, and here's his whole beef, because this is, uh, you know, a time when there's this war going on and, and in the post-millennial scheme, well, that can't be because you have this increased peace, right, that's going to lead to this golden era. And so he's basically calling Wilson a hypocrite for, for believing his view. Um, but he says this. He says, Wilson overlooks the universal scope, notice that, of this battle in which the returning Jesus will smite the nations. Wilson fails to comment on 1915, which demands his remarks, so it remains unclear how the nations can refer to Jerusalem nor does he justify restricting the referent of the kings of the earth and their armies to Jerusalem. All unbelievers on earth are slain in this battle, not merely those in Jerusalem. By all accounts, including Wilson, 1614 describes the same battle, which involves the kings of the whole world. The apocalypse unyieldingly precludes Wilson's localization. And again, that's from Jeremy. So the point is, when Jesus, according to Jeremy Sexton, when Jesus speaks of the nations, the ethnos, hearing the gospel before the end, that's local. 
But when John speaks of Jesus striking the nations, the ethnos before the end, that's universal and it involves every unbeliever in the whole wide world. You think it's because they can't, it's because there's other questions that they don't have answered that they can't use consistency? I guess. Uh, I guess it's got to be that. I mean, because he's probably got questions about all kind of stuff. This year, I mean, like who the harlot is. And he, mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably a lot of things like that that they don't know. So they can't see the connection because they an can't answer those other questions. And I admit that's a problem because, mm -hmm. I mean, I, we, we went through the same thing. Like there's there's things like this that are so clear. And Jeremy can see that. I mean, he I mean, he's literally saying that how you can yeah. go from what Jesus said to what John said and not make it the same thing is uh, there's no exegetical contextualization that's going to lead you to do anything different with the usage of that language. Well, not to mention, there's been tons of work by people from all different camps that will make note of the fact that the Roman ar Roman armies consisted of people from all over the place, right? For, there was representatives from all sorts of nations that were part of this war. And so I don't have a problem saying it's Jerusalem at all. Uh, and I don't think there's any contradiction there. No, we're going to, we're going to prove, we'll prove something on that here in just a yeah. little bit. So let's keep, let's keep going. And, and we said we would circle back to this, but Doug does touch on something that we need to discuss. He says this, and I, this is a fair question. All right. Listen to this. He says, now in order to have the way clear for the end to come, the gospel needs to have gone out to all the nations. But if the claim is made that we have fulfilled this sign of the end, then what further need is there for any continued mission work? This argument confounds the end of the Judaic system of worship and the end of the world. Can the Great Commission be fulfilled and yet somehow still be authoritative and ongoing? And if it is authoritative and ongoing, then why do we think it was fulfilled? Now, I know you're chomping at the bit here. So before you jump in, I just want to highlight that sentence where he says this argument confounds the end of the Judaic system of worship and the end of the world. I would say, Doug, you have confounded that, and you can't show me that anywhere in your Bible. Uh, anyway. I, remember, I remember being post-millennial and confused. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll make, a, I'll make a point on the end. So you've got a couple different ideas of the end. Doug's already clarified, Matthew 24, 14, that the end comes there. Okay, that is speaking of 8070. By the way, Ken Gentry does it too. Last I checked, unless he's changed his position, he takes the end in 2414 to be 8070. So he's going to have the same problem because Ken Gentry also is going to take Matthew 28 future. Well, let me just give you one, one example. Doug believes that 2 Peter chapter 3, the, the destruction of the elements in heavens and earth, Doug believes that's already fulfilled. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter said, the end of all things is at hand. There is no distinction between the end in Matthew chapter 24 and in 1 Peter chapter 4. Doug's consistent there. But for some reason, when Doug gets to other end passages, such as 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to have to make it a different end. It's the same issue as trying to make ethnos and nations mean something different in the two texts. Because what you've got is a separation of things that should never be there. And it doesn't do anything but cause confusion. Yeah. That's good. You want me to keep going on the end? No, you're good. I, I just, what I really wanted to answer, because I know this is something that you and me get asked a lot um, by people that comment or message or whatever, but it, you know, just to paraphrase the big question, it's basically, well, if you guys are right, then what's the point? You know, what, what are we supposed to be doing now? In other words, and Doug asked, then what further need is there for any continued mission work? And, you know, I, I think largely you have to change your thinking because you got to understand, and we were there, these guys have this concept of one day there's an end of history, right? All this is going to culminate somewhere, whatever your concept of that is. And when you understand that that culmination is not in mind or your future, it already happened. And now we're living in the, in the outflowing and outworking of that then you have to shift your thinking on all these other things too. And that's the question people ask. And so simply put, if, if you've asked that question, uh, what further need is there for any continued mission work? Well, do you know anybody that doesn't know the Lord? Okay. Then there's your continued date for the mission work, right? At the end of the book, revelation 21, we're told that the gates are open, 
right? And the kings bring their glory into it. In Revelation 22, um, you know, the, I believe, Zach believes, I think, that the saints are pictured as trees and our leaves are for the healing of the nations. In other words, the, the fruit that we bear, right, which we would equivocate with the gospel preaching is how people are healed. Uh, actually, my friend Mark texted me this morning, showed me something I've never seen. I think it was in Matthew 9, but Jesus equated um, sinfulness with sickness. And I wish I had the reference in front of me, but he said, you know, I wonder if there's a correlation with Revelation 22 and the healing there, because it's essentially healing the sin. I thought, man, that's good. I've never, never put that together before. Uh, but that's my thoughts. The ongoing need for mission work is because we are in the unending new covenant age and people need to know the Lord just as much as they did yesterday, just as much as they did 2000 years ago. I, I think I'd make two points on it. Number one, the gospel going out to the known world, the ethnos and what they agree 24, 14 and Mark 13 is about. Has to do with a sign to unbelieving Israel. It was a sign to them that the Gentiles were coming in. It was literally judgment on them that the Gentiles were coming in. It should have been uh, awareness to them that they were being grafted in and it should have caused them to repent and believe. That's number one. If you ask me what one of the purposes of the Great Commission was. But then secondly, I would make the point that in the first century, and Travis, I don't know where you're at on this, and I, I went back and forth on it some, but I think I'm about settled on it. When we talk about the building up of the spiritual temple, okay, the building up of what we would call the New Jerusalem, that is occurring during the Great Commission. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the house made without hands, okay? This house made without hands is going to grow for a period of 40 years. It's made up of Jews, but also likewise, the foundation are the apostles and prophets. OK, and those are those are the Jewish apostles and prophets. I take it to be. And you can read Revelation 21. But then you get the idea that the walls of this spiritual New Jerusalem are being built by the Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 2, 19, 21. You are growing and being built a spiritual temple in the Lord. So for 40 years, you have this temple being built. Well, if we want to take a, a step back and, and go back to David's time, David wanted to build the temple in 1 Kings 5, is where this is recounted after David's death. For 40 years, he's going to place his enemies under his feet. Then Solomon builds the temple. Well, once Solomon finished building the temple, did worship stop in Solomon's temple? Right. That wouldn't that doesn't make any sense at all. Did people stop coming in to worship in Solomon's temple once it was completed? No, that's the same picture as the first century that this spiritual temple is growing. Like Jesus told the woman at the well in John four, there's coming a day when you won't worship on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. You'll worship in spirit and truth. That's the new Jerusalem coming down. And that's why it's ongoing in the new heavens and new earth that the temple is completed. The city is completed and the gates aren't shut. You and I have come in. So that same mission work that they're wanting to do is still ongoing for today. And for anybody listening to this, please hear me out. Before I came to believe that the, both of these ends were the end in AD 70, I had the idea that anybody that took the second coming in the first century, that they were all universalist, that they were that they were all um, they either were universalist or they didn't think that anything applied for us today. That was my mindset. And the first time I talked to somebody that believed the second coming already happened, I asked him and said, you know, you don't think there's anything for us today? It's because I'd heard it straw man so hard. Yeah. And that really is it. I mean, that's a bad deal. Guys, please hear us. We're not saying that. Okay. Um, we we think that even if, you know, say we're wrong about the second coming, we're still right about this work going on today. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are people who are wrong on other doctrines. Like I think Doug and them are wrong on cessationism because they don't think the perfect's come yet. Right. So they're right on cessationism, but they're wrong on how they get there. So even if they're wrong on when the second coming is or we're wrong on these two comings, we can both be right on that, even though we got there in a the wrong way. But we're not saying nothing happens today. Yeah, that's right. And there and and don't mishear us either. There are some people in the full predators camps that do. But you know what? There there are people that hold extreme is that the word extreme beliefs in any camp any denomination i don't care what you're talking about well if um, you want to cut it as futurist and preterist then all the futurists are going to get all the seventh day adventists they're going to get all the mormons they're going to get right. everybody else so if you want to yeah. start well there's people in that camp that believe this well everybody's got them yep you're right 
So every bird nest has a couple cuckoos, right? Uh, I wanted to say one more thing before we move on, and and it's just Doug said he asked the question, um, can it can it be still be authoritative basically? And the undertone there is, uh, you know, you have to be following a direct order essentially to be wanting to disciple your neighbor and to share the gospel. And to me, um, and maybe I'm nitpicking, I don't know, but that just doesn't sit right with me because I know. Uh, personally, you know, what the Lord's done in my life. And I don't think I would need somebody necessarily to command me to make me want my lost neighbor uh, to come to know the Lord. You know what I mean? So uh, if you want to say it's authoritative, that's fine. But nonetheless, I think it should be your heart's desire as a follower of Jesus Christ to see people come to know him. Um, And if that doesn't resonate with you, then I don't know. I'd have some questions, but Nonetheless, let's tackle subject number two, Zach. I think this is why you paid your money to come tonight. We're going to talk about the enemies. And he didn't really pay me money, but I, I will make him buy me Chinese food. So, uh, But Jeremy says, quote, but the verse actually says that the subduing of all enemies will take place at the culmination of Christ's reign and not before. There is no indication in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 that any of Christ's enemies will be put underfoot before the point when all of them shall be. And Doug responds to that by saying, but if you combine this promise with the passages elsewhere that teach us about the gradual expansion of Christ's kingdom, it makes perfect sense. Christ's kingdom is established in principle at the ascension where he is given universal dominion over all the nations, all the tribes, all the languages, Daniel 7, 13. But the stone that is cut out without hands and strikes Nebuchadnezzar's statue on the feet is a stone that grows to become a great mountain. I see you grinning at me. Why are you laughing at Daniel 7, 13? Yeah. <laughs> living, living, I don't know, reminds me of a video I did four days ago. We'll living say water, it because everybody hadn't seen that video. Well, if you haven't seen my video, go back and watch the Matthew 16, 26 and 27 part two video. But I just made the point in there that Daniel 7 is not fulfilled at the ascension. And this guy has a video trying to get over you him. He has a video that's like 30 minutes long that really hammers that. And I linked it in the description of that video. So go do, do us both a favor and go watch both those videos. Um, I don't know where I was living, living water flows out of Ezekiel's temple. And at the beginning, it barely makes the threshold damp. But as we get closer to the healing of the nations, the aqua life is so deep. A man has to swim to keep going. So the Lord Jesus reigns in this way, gradually and inexorably, inexorably, (laughs) I don't know if I'm saying that right, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. This continues until all his enemies, death only accepted, are placed under his feet. And then he comes, and Donnie's jubilant taunt finally comes to pass, death thou shalt die. So, Zach, Jeremy's saying this isn't a gradual thing. Uh, One day in our future, it's a all at one time, you know, death is done. The enemies are put under his feet. Doug's saying, no, 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 it's this gradual thing. And still far out way in our future, the enemies are going to be put under our feet. And here's the verse they're talking about. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is the death. So, Zach, who are the enemies Paul is speaking of here? Is this abortion and... Uh, homosexual marriage and, uh, you know, Democrat taxes. I don't know, just things people get riled up about. Is that the enemies? It's not. And this is an exhaustive, uh, this is an exhaustive study. But let me just give my position up front. The enemies that Jesus is speaking, being defeated, revolve around Old Covenant Israel. And specifically, it involves the law. And there's three things. And I was talking to somebody last night for a couple hours. There's three things that are connected in the Bible. Number one, death. Number two, the law. And number three, the enemies. Satan, death, law, enemies. That's four. They're all connected, okay? (laughs) If I just keep thinking, we'll think of more because they're all connected. Satan, death, law, enemies. They all have the same exact context. You're going to see them here. For he must reign till he's put all his enemies under his feet, okay? Those enemies are going to have a direct correlation to the idea of the law because it's connected to Israel and Satan because Satan's going to be connected to Israel and the death. We didn't put this in here, I don't think. But later in 1 Corinthians 15, he says 
that the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin mm -hmm. is the, the law. law. Okay, there's your connection right there. These enemies and death will be defeated once the law is removed. These enemies and death will be defeated once the law is removed. Now you say, Zach, how come Doug can't see that the enemies have been defeated? Well, partly because Doug doesn't agree with the kind of death that is in view. When Doug says that death must be defeated one day, what he's thinking is physical death. When Travis and I read death, we're talking about a covenantal separation from God, and that separation from God was held by the old covenant system. Second Corinthians chapter three, I think beginning in verse seven, it says that the old covenant was the covenant of death. If the ministry of death was engraved on stone tablets, then the ministry of life was engraved on the holy uh, on the heart through the Holy Spirit and the new covenant work of Christ. The old covenant and the law is directly connected to the death. But there's no way around it. Yeah. No way so around it. My thoughts just hearing you say that is just kind of a common sense logic question. And that's, you know, if the law being done away with or being fulfilled, however you want to word it, is what does away with death or the death, then I and, and you ask the question to just about any living, breathing Christian, are we under the law today? They're gonna tell you no. Then why do people still die? Right. Let's make let me let's make a clarification there. When 1 Corinthians is talking about death, it's not just, or, or law, when you say under the law, mm -hmm. we're not talking about some generic law, like when it says, well, the Gentiles were a law to themselves. Right. It is definite article, the law, the, law. the old covenant law. There's no way around it. Yep. And so, friends, if we're not under that law anymore, if it's been fulfilled, we're in Christ, we shouldn't be dying if physical death is the death, if that's what's in scope here. But nonetheless, Zach, let's get into some of these verses here. Uh, you specifically requested Malachi 4.3. You want to tackle that one? Yeah, this is a John the Baptist prediction. So the day of the Lord coming with Elijah, which Doug would take the day of the Lord in Matthew chapter 3 from Malachi 4 that, Doug, that John the Baptist is predicting to be 8070. By the way, Travis, let's make another connection here. Um, we didn't put Malachi 4.4 in this, but it says, remember the law of Moses. This is a covenantal judgment by the way number one but do you remember travis what jesus uh, john the baptist called the scribes and the pharisees those under the law when they came out to his baptism i think he called them a brood of vipers a brood of vipers a satan connection that will be connected to the enemies he's saying you yep. guys are the enemies john the baptist predicted you shall tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act. What day is that? The great and dreadful day of the Lord surrounding a covenantal death, Malachi 4.4 4 and Malachi 3, 5 to 7. It's a covenantal death that Doug Wilson would say, excuse me, a covenantal judgment that Doug would say happens in AD 70. So therefore, think about the inconsistency there. These enemies are going to be placed under their feet on the covenantal day of judgment of the Lord that Doug agrees that Malachi 4 would be predicting, that John the Baptist in Matthew 3 would be predicting, and that the book of Revelation would be predicting. By the way, it's the same thing that the great the Olivet Discourse would be predicting. Leviticus 26. Yet, when those enemies are defeated, that's not good enough for Doug. Okay? Those enemies are defeated, but that's not good enough for Doug. He That is clearly a direct correlation to the most quoted to the most quoted verse in the New Testament, Psalm 110. The Lord mm -hmm. said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. That's the post-millennial mantra. Well, mm -hmm. if you'll think about just that whole idea of these enemies being made a footstool for your feet, there's a direct connection to the law and the old covenant. That's here. It's undeniable. Revelation 3.9 is the fulfillment of Malachi 4.3 is the fulfillment of Psalm 110. By the way, let me make this note. If I'm remembering right, Psalm 110 is quoted the most. Psalm 110, in Psalm 110 if you want to use metalepsis, anytime Psalm 110 is quoted, the whole thing's mm -hmm. in mind. <clears throat> Psalm 110 is quoted the most, Travis. Guess in which book? Hebrews, a covenantal mm -hmm. book. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, too, as you were talking about Malachi 4, isn't Malachi 3 where he's just hammering the priesthood for being corrupt? 
Okay, well, that's the same thought in Hebrews. He's talking about a better priesthood, right, than the old one. So all this stuff is interwoven. Is that what you're saying? And, and in all of these texts, it's pretty clear that the enemies that are in view to the first century Jew, especially, would have been the corrupt religious leaders of exactly. Old Covenant Israel. You're exactly right. Let me give you one connection. Malachi 3, 7. Well, that section, 3, 5, 6, and 7, 8. The prediction was that judgment would come upon them for um, forbidding the alien, uh, forbidding justice to the alien. Well, that's directly from the law. Go back to Deuteronomy. That's in Deuteronomy. If you forbid justice to the alien, the foreigner, the Gentile, the stranger that doesn't know me is not in the covenant, you're going to face judgment. Well, that's exactly what Paul says in First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, that they were doing, that the Jews were forbidding justice to the alien by not having that. And then he says, but wait, judgment's about to come upon them. What judgment? Covenantal judgment. You say, Zach, how are you going to connect that then to the book of Revelation? Friends, we don't have to. Doug does that. Read when the man comes around. He gets that. But there's just an inconsistency to connect all this together. You want to take Revelation 3 now or you want me to? Well, I think you already touched on that. But do it again. <laughs> I don't think I read it all. Behold, here we go. Tell me if this sounds like Malachi 4.3 and Psalm 110. I, and first Corinthians 15 behold I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie okay note the connection there we've got a Satan connection same as John the Baptist Matthew 3 same as Jesus in Matthew 23 Brood they're of not really Jews right they're not true Jews ethnic but they don't believe in the Messiah yep. but lie behold I will make them come and bow down before your feet. Well, that's Malachi 3. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet. Who are the they in Malachi 4? Those that believe in the Messiah. Who are they in Revelation 3, 9? The church, those that believe in the Messiah. They mm -hmm. will come and worship before your feet. The old covenant system will be put under the new covenant system. And the whole world's going to know that I, they will learn that I have loved you, the followers of the Messiah. That's the same as Romans chapter eight, when he says that creation is groaning and longing with birth pangs for the sons of God to see who the true sons of God really were. Was it the old covenant rejectors who said they were Jews, but weren't and lied? Or was it the followers of the Messiah? There was a vindication day coming. And that's the day that Psalm 110 was fulfilled. It's good. I didn't write the book. God did. <sighs> Amen. You, you couldn't have wrote it that good. No, I've been studying it for uh, a long time in my life, and I've just now figured it out a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I put Luke 19, 27 in here because it just goes right along with what we're talking about. So essentially in Luke 19, Jesus and, and company, they're headed to Jerusalem. Um, you see the interaction with Zacchaeus. And then right after that, Jesus tells the parable of the 10 minus 10 minus. And, uh, Long story short, um, this there was this nobleman. I'm sorry, I told you I'm sick. My brain's not working right now. Uh, this nobleman goes away into a country to receive the kingdom. He comes back, and the people didn't want him to rule over them. And, and at the end of it, and what's clear from the parable is Jesus is likening this to the people that rejected him, Old Covenant Israel, right? They didn't want him. But at the end of it, he says... Uh, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. This is about the old covenant, apostate Christ rejectors. And what does he call them in the text? Enemies. And it's the exact same thing. All the connections are there that are there in Malachi and Revelation, Hebrews, so on and so forth. Reminds me of John 1. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Now, that's the same idea, okay? That's the same idea as the story back in the Old Testament of Joseph. Joseph was told to give a report on his brothers. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came to his own. But when he gets, Joseph gets there, his brothers say, who made you ruler and king over us? You're not going to reign over us, okay? They then become his enemies. Well, there was only one of two ways you could be placed under his feet, okay? And it doesn't necessarily have to be judgment. It could also be by salvation, well, by the end of it, Joseph's brother are placed under his feet because just like Jesus, Joseph was thrown into a pit. He was raised up out of the pit, seated at the right hand of Pharaoh. And then his brothers come and submit under his feet through accepting and he accepts them. But it doesn't work out that way for all of them in the first century. Hear us out there. Every Jew in the first century was not an unbeliever. Acts tells us that many of the priests, many of those were saved. And if 
Think about the 12 disciples minus Judas, but think about all the Jews that were saved. Okay. Some of them were submitted under the feet of Christ through believing, but the enemies, those were the ones that were thrown down and destroyed. So that's one, two reasons. That's what, when he says that, I think he's drawing. There's a Joseph connection there, in my opinion. Sorry that's to do that. Go ahead. No, you're good. Um, I was just trying to figure out which one of these guys said this because I didn't quote them. I think, uh, oh, this was from, yeah, this was from Jeremy's article. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't uh, do my slideshow right. Imagine that. He says, second, the term Paul uses to describe the destruction of the rulers, authorities, and powers in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 means destroy, abolish, wipe out, bring to an end. To my knowledge, no lexicon, theological dictionary, commentary, or example from usage exists that this verb can refer to salvation, the opposite of its meaning. Uh, the two verses later, two verses later in 1526, this verb describes the destruction of death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Um, in 2 Thessalonians 2 8, it depicts the abolition of the man of lawlessness, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and will destroy by the appearance of his coming. And notice this one, Zach. In Hebrews 2 14, it refers to Christ's destruction of Satan, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. The rulers, authorities, and powers mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 24 will no more convert to Christ than will death, the man of lawlessness, or the devil. What are you thinking there? Is there a, is there a Satan connection to all this, the enemies, the things we're talking about? Well, I guess so, because you said there are four things that are connected, right? Yeah, what were they? Satan, the death, law, enemies, law. Death, enemies, yeah. Well, you know what's funny? You know who takes the man of lawlessness to be somebody in the first century? Doug Wilson. Doug Wilson. <laughs> Therefore, he's got a direct connection to Satan and to death, that he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. Because there's a direct connection to Satan here in Hebrews 2.14 and the man of lawlessness passage. So yeah, that's good. You would, have to get into, you would have to get into some of the idea of who Satan was or who Satan is, because you got a couple different ideas going on. No matter mm -hmm. what you do, there's no disconnect mm -hmm. between Satan and and old covenant Israel. There are people that think Satan's not a spiritual being, but Satan here is just simply used for adversary. Sometimes the devil can be referred to as somebody else, possibly the high priest, which would fit the idea of the man of lawlessness perfectly. But mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm at on that either. But nonetheless, this Satan idea is directly connected to old covenant Israel. It, there's no doubt. And Doug has that connection there. I just don't know how consistent that he's willing to be with it. Yeah. Or maybe he just don't, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't see it. I remember, um, you know, Don, Pre I don't remember what year they did it, but Don Preston and Sam Frost had those two debates like back to back. And um, in one of them, Sam tried to pin him in revelation somewhere on the fact that, I mean, Don basically took the view that in revelation, you know, not necessarily the whole thing, but in revelation, the Satan references were old covenant Israel. And I remember thinking, man, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, where is he getting that? And then you begin to study this stuff and you're like, oh, that's where he's getting that because it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And uh, just one example of many, you know, apart from everything that we've already talked about, we put here on the screen for you because there is a connection being made in the text. Now, Zach, didn't you tell me um, in When the Man Comes Around, Doug takes Babylon to be jerusalem or old covenant israel that's the typical partial prayers post meal position it's been a little bit since i read it but i'm i'd be willing to at least bet four dollars that i think i'm right in saying yes doug thinks that the babylon the harlot in the book of revelation is old covenant israel okay well even if he doesn't he'd be wrong right because babylon is old covenant israel all right why why is babylon old covenant israel because she is the one according to in accordance with what Jesus said in Matthew 23, she's the one that's going to be judged for killing the saints and the prophets of God. Okay, Mark, right. Matthew 23, Jesus said on this generation, Doug believes that's first century. He has to take this as Babylon the harlot. There's no other way. Well, I say that when we're pointing out his inconsistencies other places. Surely he does. Yeah. Well, she's also the same city as, as uh, Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified, right? So there's really no wiggling out of that. But uh Point is, Revelation 18 is about Babylon being thrown down, being destroyed, being judged, whatever words you want to use. 
And we read this, the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations, the ethnos, were deceived. And Zach, what's going on in the in the next one there? All right, this here's your famous passage that everybody loves to talk about, Revelation 20. Um, we've got this idea of Satan here, and this is Satan deceiving the nations. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, remember, our connection is that the enemies are, have a direct connection to Satan. The enemies have a direct connection to Satan. In this text here, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 3, because Satan in 1 Corinthians 15 also is an enemy that has to be defeated when death is defeated because all that happens at the same time. But notice in Revelation 3, 9, back in that text, that the Jews were a synagogue of Satan. So you've got your Jewish connection to Satan. And now you would ask the question, well, if there's a Jewish connection to Satan, then how in the world, I got asked this yesterday, how in the world was the Jewish system deceiving the nations? Well, they were deceiving the nations in this context. Okay. Not again, not the Zulu and all the other places, but in the first century known world, the Jews were deceiving the nation, the old covenant system, because instead of leading them to worship Yahweh, they were leading them in, into worship, not of Yahweh. They were the harlot. They were the adulterer. They were the one that would be thrown down. So if you take that to Revelation chapter 20 and you say, okay, Zach, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Okay. What's, What's the significance of that? Well, it's the same significance as Revelation 12. 12 and 20 are parallel. When the accuser's thrown down in 12, he loses the power to rule and reign. Well, when Satan here, which is connected to Old Covenant Israel, whether he is Old Covenant Israel or just merely connected to him, which we could delve that out, and I'm currently working through that, there's no doubt that the reason that Satan is thrown down, he can't rule, he's bound. Jesus said you must first bind the strong man and then Jesus was gonna plunder his goods. Well, the goods that Jesus was gonna plunder would be through the gospel that his kingdom would be taken from them, Matthew 21, and given to Jesus followers. So think about this language. Satan here is bound and thrown down out of heaven, okay? So that he can't deceive the nations with his false doctrine, his adulterous worship, his way to lead it. God, according to the Apostle Paul, had raised up those that believed in the Messiah, seated them in heavenly places. They were now the rulers, and that's why the Old Covenant system couldn't deceive the nations anymore during the time of the Great Commission so that the gospel could go forth and be proclaimed and the church would be victorious in that. That's right. All good stuff, Mr. Zach. All good stuff. Well... Did you have anything you wanted to add as we wind this thing down 47, 48 minutes later? No. I guess let me ask you this. All that being said, um, Zach, is the destruction of the enemies in 1 Corinthians 15, is that still something in our future? It can't be because no. it's connected to the death and the law. That's right. Death and the law. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law, the old covenant law, the death would be defeated at the same time the law was done away with, okay? Well, the law was done away with in the first century. The law was also connected to the enemies, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Well, death, Satan, law, enemies, all connected, all done away with at the same time, all placed under their feet. I want to say something to what Jeremy said about enemies. I think it was a process of him in the first century of those enemies being placed that it didn't all happen at once, but there was a culmination of it when the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed. Yeah, that's good. So uh, let me give you a text. Hebrews says we do not Hebrews two. We do not yet see everything in subjection to him. It was being put in subjection to him in the first century. It's an already not yet, but the already not yet friends is not 2000 years. The already not yet is what I would take to be the first century period of 40 years. Okay, but if that's the case, Travis, does that mean that you, me and you don't think abortion is an enemy of God? Absolutely not. I, we think it's an adversary. We just don't think it's contextually who's in mind for the enemies being defeated in the first century. 
Right. Words words have a context. They have a meaning. And they mean what they mean where they mean it. And, and it's no different than, you know, some of that apocaly apocalyptic imagery like in the Olivet Discourse where he's talking about, you know, heaven and earth and sun, moon and stars and this and that. Well, do those words mean things to me and you? Yes, they do. But when he spoke those words, did they have a context? Did they have a meaning to his original audience? And the answer is yes. And if we're going to, we, we cannot... And I know I, I feel like I harp on this all the time, but we cannot take their language and their setting and try to export that and carry it over into our day. And, and then when we do that and we don't bring their meaning with it, then we do whatever we want. And then we butcher the text and that's how we come to not understand things. So, yes, they're absolutely enemies of God, but that's not what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, what he was talking about, I think it's crystal clear and, and it's, you know, it harmonizes with the rest of scripture. Like we've talked about tonight. Um, simply put, it's the law, you know, the law, the sin, the death, Satan, all these things, they go together. So simply put, Doug and Jeremy, they're squabbling and they're both wrong. So I want to say this too. Like I like Doug. I've learned a lot from Doug. Like mm -hmm. you have too. I would love to sit down and talk to you guys. If y'all ever see this, like, I, I mean, Maybe you can show me where I'm wrong on this stuff. Like, but I'd love to sit down and have a conversation. We can do it just like this, and nobody ever has to see it. They don't even have to know you talk to us. Yep, that's right. We'd be willing to do it in a, in a nice, cordial way. 100%. All right, guys. Well, I guess we've reached the end of our journey. As always, it's the end. We want to ask that you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, we'll both be posting this video, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link Zach's page to mine just in case – you're, you're one of my subscribers that's not following him yet, um, and I'm sure he'll do the same. But uh, we do thank you for sharing our content. We thank you for the views and the comments. And um, I know that he and I both look forward to hearing from folks. So please drop us a comment. Tell us what you think, if you want to add anything or we missed anything or whatever. But also, while we're both here, it'd be a good time to remind them, Zach, about a little conference we got going on down here in the bunker, the Arkansas Eschatology Conference. Yeah, Don Preston's coming, Gary DeMar's coming, David Curtis is coming, Mike Sullivan, Bob Crookshank, they're all coming August 23rd to 24th. Travis, will attach that link on both of ours down in this too. So, again, it's um, – I'm not saying it's going to sell out, but it's it's on pace to sell out. So, Yep, we've sold a, a pretty good number of tickets, pretty, pretty overwhelming. We kind of did this thing kind of a shot in the dark, just see what happens, and uh, we were pretty antsy for a few months, and then – here we are like, oh, we're going to be fine, you know. So now we're at the point of like talking about how we can pizzazz it up a little. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We got time. So anyway, we do thank you for watching.